Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to News Plus, one of the most viewed television broadcasting news analysis program that has been received amazing comments across Africa. As you all know, every Tuesday we're live at 1 p.m. African time with our viewers. And today there are amazing new developments happening from Baku as well as from United States. We have very important uh, people that we will host today. I have a human rights defender, a phenomenal gentleman, Ahmed Shahido, who is joining us from Baku, Azerbaijan. He is the director of the Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights. Welcome, Ahmed Shahido. Honored to have you today. Good evening. I greet you from Baku, Azerbaijan. Thank you for your time. Uh, I want to get right into first, uh, you know, you have been doing amazing work, but for our viewers shortly, who is Ahmed Shahido? And what is the Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights doing? Uh, yes, I greet you again from Baku. I'm a human rights defender. I, uh, I'm the head of Azerbaijan Institute for Democracy and Human Rights since 2014. And uh, we are dealing with human rights and democratic issue in Azerbaijan in the whole uh, South Caucasus region. So we defend uh, the rights of the people we protect the rights of our citizens and everyone who needs our help. Thank you. And we, our goal is really today to cover every angle of the current situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. And first of all, congratulations to every person in the world in, in the name of democracy, in the name of human rights, in the name of the UN resolutions now the Nagorno-Karabakh has been liberated. First of all, I want to congratulate every person around the world who is for human rights and who is for democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yavuz Bey. I also join your congratulations and I congratulate all Azerbaijan people, all citizens of Turkey and all uh, citizens across the world who stand for human rights, for justice and the implementation of UN uh, Security Council resolutions. We understand uh, with the adventurous attitude of Pashinyan, now he's been actually penalized by his very own people. There have been really amazing stories coming out, uh, or unfortunate stories coming out, one way or another. Uh, we still don't know if the foreign minister actually has resigned or he has uh, asked that person to leave. And as we know, there have been lots of sacking events, lots of uh, turbulations happening inside uh, Yerevan. So I want to get your feedback on why did we come to this situation? Why did we wait 30 years? And what is the current situation right now on the ground? This is very important, ladies and gentlemen, because for many who are viewing us from Africa, as you all know, this is another part of the world, you know, uh, and Russia, after the Soviet communist regime, you know, there have been new republics came out, and Armenia and Azerbaijan are two republics who came out after the, you know, uh, Cold War ended. And that's why we are asking now our beautiful friend and colleague, the human rights defender, Ahmed Shahido, the current situation right now, what is going on on the ground in Nagorno-Karabakh? Yes, the current situation, uh, let me uh, briefly describe the latest development on the region. As you know, the uh, second stage of the war on the Nagorno-Karabakh front, which uh, began on September 27, ended with the victory of the Republic of Azerbaijan and with this victory was expected by the people of Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan has been uh, fighting for many years in uh, different uh, fields, in political arena, in battlefield, and we, uh, we lost Nagorno-Karabakh and seven surrounding regions in the early 1990s, but uh, for the past uh, almost 30 years we have uh, never given up on uh, such a struggle because in addition to being historically our lands, these territories are also 
uh, internationally recognized uh, as Azerbaijani lands. And after the first ceasefire agreement signed in May uh, 1994, uh, 94, Azerbaijan raised its rightful voice on all international platforms, raised our voice against uh, Armenia's policy of aggression, and we wanted the world community, all countries in the world, not to remain silent about this occupation, about this aggression. And we demanded the implementation of four UN Security Council resolutions. We wanted the decisions of the Council of Europe, the OEC, and other international organizations to be respected, to be implemented. However, Armenia was uh, determined to continue the occupation, and the world uh, turned a blind eye to it. Uh, at the same time, Azerbaijan continued to strengthen its economy and army. And in recent years, the Azerbaijani army has, has become one of the strongest armies, not only in the region, not only in the South Caucasus, South Caucasus but also in the world. Of course, uh, Brazil and Turkey also supported uh, us in this issue. Turkey has provided us with all the necessary support uh, over the uh, past years. And at the same time, Armenia continued its provocations on the front line and uh, on the border between the two countries, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And the last such provocation was repeated on uh, Sunday, September 27. And in response uh, to these provocations, the Azerbaijan army launched uh, a very successful large-scale uh, counter-offensive uh, military operations. And one after another, our villages and cities were liberated from Armenian occupation. And uh, the logical end of the Nagorno-Karabakh war came on uh, November 9 with the regaining uh, of Shusha city. You know, Shusha is very important city in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, and this is very holy city for Azerbaijani people. This is the um, uh, center of Azerbaijani history, Azerbaijani culture, and uh, has very strategic uh, importance in a battlefield as well. So the brave Azerbaijani army cleared the city of Shusha of Armenian invaders, and after uh, 27 years, the tricolor flag of Azerbaijan began to fly again in Shusha city. And so it was a very historic victory. It was a triumph of truth and justice. It was also the implementation of international law, in particular for resolutions of the uh, UN Security Council. And as you know, uh, uh, for uh, in 1993 and in 1994, UN Security Council has adopted four uh, resolutions on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and all these uh, resolutions uh, demanded uh, immediately withdrawal of all external troops from occupied Azerbaijani lands and uh, returning the Azerbaijani IDPs to these lands. Unfortunately, uh, over the past 30 years, uh, these resolutions has not been implemented, and only Azerbaijani army uh, has implemented two of these uh, four resolutions on battle, uh, battlefield. Ahmed, so I have a quick point here. As you know, we have been watching in 37 days, correct me if I'm wrong, the entire war has happened. And in 37 days, Azerbaijani army has claimed one of the most important historical victory in the humanity because with the modern warfare winning a war with a very mountainous area, and to your point, getting Susha, if Azerbaijan wanted to continue, Azerbaijan could have taken the other places because the hardest part is mountainous area. The other cities next to each other are six, seven kilometers. But despite Armenia every time broke the ceasefire and sent missile bombs to civilian areas, Azerbaijan hold its position, never attacked Armenia, always kept the war inside the area which has been uh, occupied by, uh, and I'm wondering, how did the last signature happen? What are the reasons Azerbaijan did not clear out? Because it was much easier. Azerbaijan already finished most of the area. Why did Azerbaijan again chose peace? Uh, because the other res uh, you know, ceasefires every time was broken by Armenia. That's why I'm saying, why did Azerbaijan again 
chose peace this time. And what will happen? What are the rules of this agreement? And what does it mean for the people in Nagorno-Karabakh? Uh, yes, very important question. And, uh, you know, Azerbaijan is a peaceful country. We are a Muslim Turkish country. We always stand for peace and prosperity in the region. And also, uh, since uh, September 27, uh, there were three uh, uh, ceasefire agreements uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Two of them reached in uh, Moscow, and one of them is uh, reached in uh, Washington. But uh, always in all these three uh, peaceful agreements, uh, Armenia violated the ceasefire and fired on a civilian uh, wheelers and civilian citizens of Azerbaijan. Uh, I want to remind the uh, fire attacks on Ganja city, on Berda city, and Armenian armed forces uh, fired these uh, cities, these civilian settlements from the territory of Republic of Armenia. So uh, always Armenia violated the ceasefire and Azerbaijan uh, has to uh, respond to these provocations. And what about the Shusha city? You know, it was uh, after the regaining of Shusha that Armenia officially acknowledged its defeat finally and offered to start negotiations. And then on November 10, uh, a trilateral agreement was signed between Armenia, Russia, and Azerbaijan, laying the foundation for long term peace and coexistence in Nagorno Karabakh. Before the Shusha city, uh, recapture of Shusha, Armenia uh, continued to uh, make provocations on front line and uh, didn't uh, admit its defeat. But Shusha, as I uh, mentioned it before, is very strategic point and to have Shusha, uh, you have the control over the Han Kandy and other regions of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, Shusha is very high mountain uh, city uh, located on the mountains and if you, Azerbaijan army uh, in Shusha it means that Azer Azerbaijan uh, very easily can reach to Han Kandy, to Kalbajar, to Lachan and uh, after uh, regaining the Shusha Armenia finally admit its defeat and uh, forced, uh, forced to uh, sign this uh, agreement with Azerbaijan and uh, via the, uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, what about this agreement? You know, uh, uh, what about your question about Azerbaijan uh, can uh, continue this fighting? Sure, we have uh, enough resources and we, our Azerbaijan army is very strong to continue this uh, war until uh, regaining all other territories. but. Uh, if we, we are a peaceful country and uh, by uh, mediation uh, of the Russian Federation, we uh, have agreed uh, to continue our struggle on, in, on political arena. So this agreement is also uh, means uh, a victory of Azerbaijan because according to this agreement, the Armenian army will withdraw from all occupied territories uh, until December 1, Kalbajar, Ardam, and Lachan regions will be returned to Azerbaijan, and the Azerbaijan army uh, will control these areas. And Armenians and Azerbaijanis will live to, together in other parts of Nagorno Karabakh, and Russian peacekeepers will monitor the ceasefire in those areas. That's my question. Uh, how will the ceasefire monitoring will actually work? I mean, how will the Russians? And the Turkish forces be located in the region. As you all know, the Turkish parliament just passed a resolution after the agreement between Russia and Turkey on November 11th. I'm wondering how will the actual monitoring work and that five-year term? I'm very curious about your opinion. Yes, uh, uh, immediately after this uh, agreement, 1,960 Russian soldiers are deployed in the region, uh, especially in those areas that the war uh, didn't reach. Uh, I mean, Han Kandy, Hojalı, uh, Ağdara, Eskaran, and other regions where the Armenians and Azerbaijans used to live before uh, the first Nagorno Karabakh war. So uh, it means that Russian soldiers will be uh, are deployed in this region to monitor the ceasefire. 
and uh, the sure uh, from the first uh, days Azerbaijan Azerbaijan side demanded Turkey uh, to be involved in uh, these negotiations so uh, one this is the one of the preconditions that Azerbaijan put uh, to see a Turkish army to uh, locate the Turkish army in the region so we have uh, um, uh, we have this condition and after uh, these negotiations Turkey Turkish and Russian uh, sides are uh, agreed about this issue and in a couple of days maybe uh, Turkish army will be deployed in the region as well so uh, according to this agreement uh, Russian army will be deployed are, de are already deployed in those areas where the uh, Armenians and, uh, and Azerbaijanis will uh, live together but uh, about the location of Turkish army. Turkish army will be uh, deployed in those areas that uh, regained by the Azerbaijan army. Uh, and it is the issue between the Turkey and Azerbaijan where in, in what city the Turkish army will be uh, deployed. It, will, it can be uh, Shusha, it can be Pizuli, it can be uh, Jabrail or wherever uh, Azerbaijan wish to have Turkish army. But I think that uh, Turkish army uh, should be uh, very close to Russian army. It's from the point of uh, uh, national interest of Azerbaijan to have guaranteed that tomorrow uh, Russian army uh, will not violate this uh, agreement between uh, Azerbaijan, Russia and Armenia. So I think that the Turkish army should be uh, maximum close to uh, those points where the Russian army are uh, deployed. So we will see uh, in a couple of days where the Turkish army will be deployed. But it's our sovereign right to uh, invite any uh, soldiers, uh, Turkish soldiers, uh, to our territory. And, but uh, according to uh, this agreement between Russia, Azerbaijan and Armenia, uh, the IDPs uh, from Azerbaijan will also return to this lands, uh, I mean to Hankandi, to Hocalı, to Eskaran, to Erdaran, to Ardara, and uh, only Russian army will uh, monitor the ceasefire and together living of Armenians and Azerbaijans. But the Turkish army will also uh, be located in this area, but not on those villages, on those points where our Russians uh, are located, but very close to these points. So uh, another important uh, part of uh, this argument between Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan is the establishment of uh, land uh, links between Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic and the uh, main land of Azerbaijan. It's very important and yes. strategically uh, important issue for Azerbaijan. After that, uh, Azerbaijani citizens will be able to easily cross the territory of Armenia to Nakhchivan and from there to Turkey and to Europe. So uh, I think that this agreement unequivocal means the victory of Azerbaijan and Azerbaijani people. That's why today the people of Azerbaijan uh, celebrate this victory today. Azerbaijani refugees, uh, refugees and IDPs are preparing to return, return to their homes. And uh, the Azerbaijani state will carry out uh, large-scale construction and landscaping work in these liberated territories and life in those lands in Nagorno-Karabakh will be revived soon and Azerbaijan will uh, monitor uh, the liberated territories and open a lawsuit for this damage and this is also on our agenda that Armenia will have to pay uh, 50 billion in compensation in financial compensation so Armenia that part is on the important. other hand I mean, had, uh, in terms of the in terms of, I know mothers who are holding the soil of Karabakh, protecting in their heart at their home in Ganja for more than 30 years. For them, they are getting back to their uh, original home. So after 30 years, oh. this victory is historical, but especially for more than 1 million people who were dislocated from their original places. There will be, I think, lots of work to rebuild, because as far as I know, as the Armenians uh, withdraw, they are burning cities, they are burning even uh, houses, unfortunately, or churches, yes. religious places. So uh, on one side, there will be a rebuilding 
that needs to be done in the region, helping these relocated people get back to their houses and then restart their life under a peaceful uh, time. I'm very curious, uh, you know, when do you think the normalization will happen? I've seen pictures of President Ilham Aliyev and his wife in these beautiful areas that you shared on your social media. Thank yes. you for that. And I want to understand from your view, when we look at the entire world media, I have seen an interview between BBC and Ilham Aliyev, where Ilham Aliyev really provided an amazing response back because they are claiming as if there is no human rights inside Azerbaijan, there is no uh, you know, uh, free press, and no internet users, and he responded very nicely. So there are still attempts to actually overcome the rightful, uh, you know, regaining of the occupation and clearing and getting back to these lands. There are still image makers who are trying to change the media. So I want to get your opinion. How did the media around the world take the victory of Azerbaijan? You know, from the first day of the clashes uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, unfortunately, the world media, uh, almost uh, a big part of the world media, uh, supported the aggression, Armenian aggression, and uh, tried to show these clashes as Azerbaijan uh, saw uh, attacks in Nagorno-Karabakh, civilian people in the region. So by this, they try to, how to say, to pressure uh, to Azerbaijan to stop these military operations. And these uh, and those uh, world media uh, channels, uh, newspapers, internet websites, they never shown how uh, Armenia fired on Ganja. They never show uh, how Armenia uh, attacks to Baghdad city to uh, civilians in Azerbaijan. I want to remind you that uh, more than uh, 91 civilians were killed during this uh, firing on the Ganja, Berda, and Tartar, and more than 400 people were wounded. And these uh, worldwide televisions uh, didn't show these uh, pictures. And uh, they tried to uh, uh, show the victory as Victor of Azerbaijan as violation of state border, uh, why, why, uh, uh, invention of Azerbaijan, like this. But finally, Azerbaijan, uh, the president of Azerbaijan, responded to all these uh, televisions. You know, all, all worldwide televisions sent uh, their uh, strongest journalists, strongest anchors. To be uh, to to interview with uh, president of Azerbaijan, but uh, Azerbaijani president Ilham Aliyev uh, responded to all difficult questions, all provocative questions of these televisions, and once again uh, showed that Azerbaijan uh, has the right, sovereign right to restore its uh, territorial integrity and protect its uh, international recognized uh, state borders. And what about the human rights issues? Uh, you know, Azerbaijan is a newly uh, uh, independent country. We have uh, get our independence in 1991. Uh, 91. Sure, we, we may have some difficulties with elections, with, uh, in the, uh, with human rights, democratic issues, but it doesn't mean that uh, we uh, can, we cannot restore our total integrity. But anyway, uh, the spaces, the problems with human rights in Azerbaijan is not so uh, uh, so tragedy like BBC, CNN, and other international televisions uh, talk about it. As NTR, as NTR, from the first day this started, and especially News Plus. We started uh, educating our viewers, and we promised them to only bring the truth, and only the truth. And yeah. we started first explaining the Khojeli genocide and how yes. it happened. If the Azerbaijani and Turkish army were in Khojeli uh, uh, 30 years ago, that genocide would never happen. That's my personal yeah. opinion. And Yeah, that those international organizations uh, talking about uh, uh, how the so-called violation of human rights in Azerbaijan. They never uh, 
uh, touched the uh, Kojali genocide in 1992 uh, when uh, Armenian soldiers in one night killed uh, more than uh, 600 innocent people, civilians, and they have never, uh, they never allowed these people to leave their land and go to the main part of Azerbaijan. But today, uh, our Armenian side asked for more 10 days more to leave Kalbajar and Azerbaijan as a peaceful country again showed its humanity yes. and allowed Armenian people uh, to leave Kalbajar very peacefully uh, and allowed to uh, liberate uh, Kalbajar until 25th uh, of November. But according to this agreement between Armenia, Russia and Azerbaijan, Armenian side uh, uh, has to leave Kalbajar until uh, 15, uh, 15th November. But they asked uh, Azerbaijan to allow uh, more 10 days. But anyway, Azerbaijan showed its humanity. But Absolutely. what about in 1993 when Kalbajar was occupied, Armenian side uh, only they uh, allow only 10 or uh, 9 or 10 hours to leave Kalbajar and it was impossible that's why a lot of our people were killed in Kalbajar during uh, uh, 1993 so this is the difference between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and you uh, mentioned about the burning uh, of uh, the house in Kalbajar the, and even cutting, Armenians, trees, they, even cutting trees they yeah, they trees, cut the tree, they, they burning burn everything. their homes, they, uh, they try to uh, take everything uh, with them. So they, they understand that uh, the Kalbajar uh, doesn't belong to Armenians. They, these lands belong to Azerbaijanis and they will never return these lands. That's why they uh, uh, try to uh, destroy everything, they, to uh, take everything uh, with them to uh, Armenia to Yerevan. But anyway, Azerbaijan is a multicultural country, as President of Azerbaijan Aliyev said, that, uh, that those Armenians who used to live in uh, nagorno karabakh before uh, 90s, they can return to these lands and live together with Azerbaijanis, and they will have uh, equal rights with the other people, uh, other ethnics. Uh, living in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan uh, is a uh, peaceful and uh, multicultural country. We have uh, more than 40 uh, nationalities living in Azerbaijan. We have also uh, 40,000 Armenians living in Azerbaijan, in Baku, in Ganja, and in different cities of Azerbaijan. We have Armenian church uh, in Baku city center. We have Armenian uh, people uh, living in Azerbaijan, so we, we, we haven't any problem with uh, Armenian nation, with Armenian uh, nationality. We have problem with uh, Armenian uh, authorities, uh, military uh, uh, leading people, military authorities that occupied Azerbaijan lands more than 30 years, and we are trying to liberate, liberate our lands and we have done it already and we, we wish uh, to restore the uh, national uh, and state borders of Azerbaijan. We Absolutely. have done it already and we, we demand uh, to, uh, implement a, to implement the uh, UN Security Council resolutions and we have done it already. Ahmed, I want to uh, get your opinion on what will happen to Nikol Pashinyan and his sponsors right now. You know, I'm sure the sponsors of Nikol Pashinyan are kind of upset. And what do you think will happen next inside Armenia? Uh, you, know? you know, you know, Armenia uh, had to come uh, to terms with historical realities and finally uh, considered its defeat and the civil uh, conflict and chaos in Armenia today prove it once again and. Uh, today, Armenians are protesting against Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and uh, because more than uh, 15,000 Armenian soldiers were killed on the front line. And uh, I think uh, the Armenia should have taken a wise step in time to get uh, rid of these tragedies. It is 
uh, impossible to develop and gain a place in the world by occupying the lands of its neighbors and because the world community sees everything and understands it well. I hope that from now uh, on uh, Armenia will respect international law and pursue, uh, pursue a policy of kindness with its neighbors. There is no other way to achieve peace in the region. Uh, you know, and now uh, protests, uh, we see the uh, pro daily protest actions in year one, the people protesting against the uh, Armenians' defeat in Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, they demand Nikol Pashinyan to resign. And we see uh, a lot of uh, resigns in uh, Armenian government. Uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mnatsakanyan, has resigned already. The other um, uh, high-level uh, officials uh, or resigned or uh, taken off, removed from their positions. And Armenia now is uh, in a very bad uh, situation. Uh, out there. there is chaos and uh, civil war in Armenia, so between each between the political parties and Armenia face to face with chaos because it's defeats in Nagorno-Karabakh. And I think that uh, if Nikol Pashinyan uh, very bad in uh, Armenia. Will, and when you look at it, you know, after this 30 year of occupation and regaining these areas, do you think this peace will be sustainable, Ahmed? Do you think, because there are five year terms, from your opinion, your personal opinion, do you think this peace is sustainable? And how can we make sure this region, after all these wars, we want peace for everyone in this region? So you know, do you uh, think what we uh, should do to make this area sustainable? You know, I, I hope that uh, I hope that this uh, agreement between Armenia, Russia, and Azerbaijan will uh, stand for a long time, and we have uh, we uh, wish it. But everything uh, everything depends on Armenia. We heard some. Uh, provocative uh, calls from different Armenian politicians to violate uh, this uh, argument and to continue the war. But Azerbaijan is also ready for any uh, conclusion, for any uh, picture on Nagorno-Karabakh. But anyway, I think the Russian peacekeepers will do their best to, uh, uh, to monitor the ceasefire. Uh, between the conflicting sides, and also we have the, another guarantee, and one of the main guarantee I, I, I want to mention, uh, the Turkey's role in the region, because uh, we can say that Turkey has been actively supporting Azerbaijan since the beginning of these military operations, and has been with Azerbaijan in all uh, its decisions. And today, the uh, deployment of the Turkish army in the region is on the agenda along with the Russian army, the Turkish armed forces will uh, monitor the peace and ceasefire in Nagorno-Karabakh, and this is very important for us, for Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan has put forward these conditions from uh, the first days, and this issue is already being resolved, I think, and to have long-standing peace and ceasefire in the region, Turkey uh, will play a very significant role as well, and Azerbaijan uh, Azerbaijan's side uh, also uh, respect this uh, agreement, the uh, requirements of this agreement. So I think that uh, everything uh, will depend on Armenia, how the uh, Nikol Pashinyan government or the next uh, authorities after Nikol Pashinyan who will come to the power, how will they uh, respect this agreement. But anyway, the responsibility will lie on Armenia. And I think Russia and Turkey will monitor together, monitor the ceasefire uh, agreement. But anyway, uh, Azerbaijan is ready for any uh, development of this uh, uh, process in the region. If uh, uh, it will be the next stage of war, we will continue to liberate uh, the another lands. I mean, uh, Khan Kandy, Khojalu, Agdara. So, uh, uh, if the uh, situation will be in this direction, and uh, it will be uh, uh, important to launch new military operations, the Armenia will meet uh, more tragic situations. 
So it means that I, I hope that uh, Armenian side will not risk to violate uh, the requirements of this uh, peace agreement, of this ceasefire agreement. I mean, we want peace for the region, and we are just wondering how will the Armenia-Azerbaijan relations will be in the future, because this region is very important, not just for Azerbaijan or Armenia. Armenia. It's important for Russia, it's important for China, it's important for Turkey, it's important for United States, even the regional powers, because there are many uh, you know, strategic areas in this area. So even though this is a, you know, a fight against an occupation, uh, that's why uh, even United States and other big uh, players did not oppose to the development. Do you agree with that? Uh, you know, this region is very uh, important, not only for Azerbaijan, for Armenia, for uh, South Caucasus. It's very uh, strategic area for uh, Europe, for United States, for China as well. If uh, uh, to look to the details of this agreement between uh, uh, the Armenia, Russia and Azerbaijan, there are a lot of humanitarian aspects in this agreement about transportation, about um, uh, the future development of this region. If Armenia will respect this uh, agreement, uh, in the near future, uh, Armenia will uh, go uh, further with its development. And all international projects, I mean pipelines and other uh, very strategic uh, uh, projects can uh, go across the Armenia that uh, lead can be lead the uh, development of this country as well and we, we will achieve more uh, significant uh, outcomes in uh, economic arena and in uh, the, the another kind of uh, developments so i think that uh, u.s european countries china all these countries all international community should be interested to have uh, peace in the region so the uh, the uh, happy future of the Nagorno-Karabakh, the happy future of this region is the main reason of uh, uh, stability of the economic and political stability in Europe, in United States, because all the projects, international projects from China to Europe uh, goes across Azerbaijan, from South Caucasus, that uh, all these projects can be uh, done uh, across the Armenia as well, and it will uh, positively affect the uh, economy of Armenia about, uh, to uh, future of Armenian people as well. So uh, not only Armenia and Azerbaijan should think about the peace and prosperity in the region, all international communities uh, should think about it and uh, do their best to keep this long-standing peace and prosperity in Nagorno-Karabakh. Dear Ahmed, uh, as NTR TV, uh, we really care about strong nations respecting each other, fully independent, and doing the best work for humanity in technology, in finance, in economy, in trade. So I want to get your opinion because we have more than 900 million viewers and more than 40 countries watching you right now live through NTR. And NTR is the only TV from Turkey broadcasting to Africa to more than 900 million viewers. And with Turkstat's new launch, we will be broadcasting to entire Africa. And since the beginning of this uh, conflict, we carefully monitored the situation on the ground and really try to bring the truth to our viewers and try to bring, maybe we are one of the only TV channels telling the truth to our African brothers and sisters. I want to get your final opinion about NTR TV as well as your final messages to our viewers in Africa because Azerbaijan is important for Africa and Africa is important for Azerbaijan. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I especially uh, thanks to all uh, people working in uh, NTR TV because this is very uh, important. Uh, tribune for us to deliver, to convey our message uh, to African people, to all uh, countries in uh, Africa. Also, Africa is very important uh, land for Azerbaijan as well. We, we have very good uh, mutual relations with different African countries. And we are a lot of African students in uh, 
studying in Azerbaijan, living here. We have uh, as well our interest in African countries as well. And uh, But unfortunately, Azerbaijan has not uh, so strong uh, tribune as NTR TV as you. But anyway, uh, your tribune, your television is also uh, the, another chance for uh, us to convey the realities to deliver the truth of Azerbaijan to African people, to have a mutual exchange of views uh, with our African brothers. And also Azerbaijan uh, is ready to um, be involved in uh, development in all uh, future processes uh, going on uh, African countries. So thanks to NTR TV that uh, does this uh, very strong and important work in uh, Africa uh, and I always watch your television online on YouTube and on another uh, uh, social networks uh, online platforms you uh, do very huge work uh, and I wish you to continue this work and to strengthen the relations between Azerbaijan and Turkey with African countries and uh, I'm very happy to be interviewed on uh, NTR TV and hope we will continue to, uh, our cooperation, uh, not regarding the Azerbaijani issues. We can uh, cooperate in uh, problems uh, of African people, the issues that Africa uh, you know, regard, involved uh, in African countries as well. So uh, I wish you best in your uh, very, this very important activity. Ahmed uh, Shahido, I want to thank you as well. You are a really, a, you know, role model in terms of how a person can defend human rights. And I thank want you. to thank you on behalf of NTR TV. Thank you, thank and, you so much. You know, your organization is doing a very important job. We would love to host you one day in Ankara, and we would love to come sure. and visit in Baku, and maybe have a trip together in Africa in the future. Inshallah, uh, inshallah. Uh, thank, thank you very so much, much for your time. Well. I want to thank you on behalf of NTR TV and looking forward to uh, staying tuned with you in the future as well. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, uh, we are ending the Azerbaijan uh, situation part and Nagorno-Karabakh part. Stay tuned to NTR TV. We'll be joining back and connecting to United States about the most recent elections in United States. Take care and all the best. Stay tuned to NTR TV. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to News Plus, one of the most viewed news analysis shows across Africa in more than 40 countries, in more than 900 million viewers. As you know, the elections in the United States has become one of the top agendas and how it will impact Africa, what will be the impact around the world, and will Trump really actually say, accept the current situation and move on? All of these discussions. We have an amazing guest who is one of the top community leaders from Miami, Florida, my great colleague, Mehmet Yashar Ulutash, who is building bridges between Turkey, United States, and Africa. Welcome, Mehmet Yashar Ulutaş. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on this wonderful program. I am honored, I am privileged to be here and talk about, talk with you, Yavuz. Uh, this is a great program, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. Thank you, Mehmet. I know how busy you are, and I really appreciate on behalf of NTR TV, during your busy schedule, you had the chance to talk and give us a good feedback about the situation because Florida itself is also an important state in the entire election. So first thing first, for our viewers, I know you are very active in the Turkish American Steering Committee as well as for the one million voters uh, you know, initiative which has started by MGAGE, you are the chair in South Florida and you are very much involved in your community. So can you tell for our 900 million viewers who Mehmet Yashar Ulutash is. Okay. Um, I am, first of all, I'm an engineer. 
I'm an engineer, and of course, in time, I graduated to be an associate vice president for the company that I work for, which is an international engineering consulting company, which has offices in Africa. Wow. In, very, in uh, several countries, in several countries in Africa, and we have been doing several projects in Africa, all over Africa as well. But uh, as a, as a community activist. Uh, I have been serving in the community that I've been living in, which is South Florida, for ever since I set foot in the United States. I started out with the uh, Turkish American Student Association, then it was Asian American Advisory Board, and then uh, Coalition of South Florida Muslim Organizations, which is Cosmos, that I'm quite proud of and Engage, which I have been involved with for the past, I would say, seven, eight years at least, which is the engaging the, uh, the, the, the Muslim Americans and empowering and engaging Muslim Americans in the politics, in the U.S. politics. And uh, again, I've been on several, uh, on the board of several NGOs. And uh, my take, my primary objective is to improve the improve the representing power of U.S. Uh, the Mu Turks and Muslims in the United States in the U.S. politics. That's, That's a very important mission. Objective. That's a very important mission. Uh, Mehmet, in general, you know, for our viewers who just opened up because we're live now to Africa, what are the major differences between Trump and Biden, between a Democrat and Republican in terms of policies? Uh, it's an interesting question. I, I don't know where to start, but it's like uh, South Pole and North Pole. <laughs> They're very different. They're very different personalities. But it's mainly because Trump is a different person. I see. Trump is one of a kind. He doesn't have a... There's no president to Trump. There, there was no president that I know of who was slightly resembling to Trump. So, uh, and this... Uh, so... Uh, that those are the major differences between them. Uh, they call Biden after he got, you know, uh, sort of uh, elected or not elected. That's something that we are going to discuss later on. But uh, they call Trump unpresidential, while Biden presidential, meaning like a more presentable, more president-like uh, person. Uh, those are the ma major differences. Then if we go into the uh, including the needy and greedy. Trump was running the country on, I would say, commercial principles, as if he's running his own company. And he said that out loud several times, which, uh, which was very much liked by his supporters. And when he came, one of his uh, motto was disruption of the existing establishment. He, he, he believes that there's an establishment, which a lot of people believe the same way, and he came to disrupt that establishment. And to, uh, to, to be honest with you, to some extent, he did. And that's why he's now called, the, the, the way that he is uh, running the country is called Trumpism. Mm -hmm. So there is a new verb for him, Trumpism. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, Biden... Uh, he will be, I can tell you that he will be running the country on the established, on the establishment based on the rules by the establishment. And let's go with the um, examples like uh, he will not be firing uh, someone uh, via Twitter or he will not wake up at 5 a.m. and send tweets to, uh, to everybody in the world. And... If you want me to compare it, uh, he will be very boring compared to Trump. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that I can, yeah. that's, that's a very interesting analysis. Thank you for that. So from your view, dear Mehmet, what will be the very first actions President Biden is going to take once he starts officially at the White House? He, uh, he actually mentioned those in several uh, programs and uh, campaign uh, statements. As a matter of fact, one of them was the one that he did for us, for Engage, mm -hmm. uh, from his house in, uh, in Delaware, yes. where he said on the first day, 
he will, one of the things that he will remove is the Muslim travel ban, yes. which includes, I believe, 10 to 12 uh, Muslim countries, uh, primarily in the uh, Middle East and maybe some African countries. Uh, that's, that's one of the things that he will do the first day. He promised us that. Mm -hmm. And there are other things, but to sum it up, I can tell you that what Biden will do when he, came, when he is the first day or within the 100 days, because he has two things, Once, some, some uh, promises that he made that he's going to do the, on the day one. And then there are some other promises that he will be doing within the first 100 days. Uh, the Muslim, traveling, uh, the Muslim ban is uh, tra removing Muslim ban, Muslim travel ban is number one. Then there's another one called uh, COVID-19 task force. That's the, f the that's the, the the first thing that he's going to do when he's in White House. What he wants to do is uh, form a COVID-19 task force, which was initially in the early 2019. Trump had one too. But he will. Uh, this one, he will. This he uh, he says that this will be more comprehensive, and one of the ta tasks that that COVID-19 task force will be doing is uh, to determine who will get the vaccine first, or and uh, that's a very important task because uh, there, are, there are almost 350 million people living in the United States. And I do not think that we will have 350 million vaccines ready on day one. So sure. that has to be distributed uh, based on priorities. You know, they always say that the first responders will get the first vaccines, which is fine, which is how it should be. Uh, and that's another thing that that's he's he will have this task force. Do you're right? I mean, you know, as Moderna, BioNTech, and many others, Pfizer. Many companies are working, but even the you know BioNTech, which is the Pfizer uh, vaccine, which is so far the most effective one with more than 95% efficacy. He personally, Dr. Shine, who is a Turkish German, he mentioned that uh, he will have until April 300 million doses ready. So as you said, uh, prioritization will be important, and unfortunately, United States has been. Uh, struck really bad uh, with more than 250,000 passed away, and many are, uh, you know, uh, the, the you know the infection rates have not gone down yet. So I hope uh, things will move in the right direction. Uh, I, I'm also wondering from your view because we want to focus on what will happen now in terms of Biden and Trump. Uh, Mehmet, from your view, do the Trump supporters? accept the result election, result of the elections. And I know there was a recent rally uh, in Washington, D.C. How is the atmosphere right now in the United States? Well, uh, Trump supporters, a min minority of Trump supporters are not happy with this. And as just like you said, they are the, doing rallies in different uh, cities. So far, it has not escalated to a point where it becomes a national threat. It has not come to that. And I don't expect it to be come to that. And uh, I think time will heal and time will uh, bring those supporters back to their senses eventually. And I don't think anything uh, like some say uh, like civil war or such a thing, I don't think that's ever going to happen. That was 150 years ago, and we are past that. The United States has passed that. And, but there will be some rallies. There will be some uh, people, upset people with the decisions. But as time will pass, as the election results will more become more crystal clear, and then uh, this will go away, I think. That's, that's, why, that's what I believe is going to happen. Now, uh, if you ask me who is going to win, I think Biden is going to win. I mean, he, they say he already won, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually with the numbers, he will. There's a, there's a process going on. Uh, Trump is basically, he is relying on legal stance. 
So what he wants to do is, uh, what he has been doing is, as far as I could follow, is opening up lawsuits and filing lawsuits in different states, basically saying that there's fraud, there is uh, illegal uh, voting activities, illegal uh, wo uh, counting, vote mm -hmm. counting activities, mm -hmm. and such. So, and then there are some examples, like uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, they say that the, 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 some mailman postmarked the ballots at an earlier date than the election, which is 3rd of November. In somewhere else, I believe it was uh, Pennsylvania, they let some, uh, I mean, there were some ballots found uh, with the names, with the deceased people's names on it. So people are already dead, and here you go, they have uh, somehow cast their vote. But at the end of the day, based on what I have heard and what, what I have read, they say that even if these incidents, these f frauds uh, are there, they are, they, don't, they are not in substantial numbers. In other words, it will not change the election results. So that's why they are saying that eventually Biden will win. But Trump has another card that he's planning to use, at least that's what I have been seeing, which is using the Supreme Court card, which is that on that one, his basis is that states like Pennsylvania let people send their votes even on the day of election, okay? And then let, and then the state accepted those ballots until Friday the 6th of November. And they had declared this before the election, I believe a few weeks before the election. And even then, it was a bone of contention. And Trump, even back then, said that this is not acceptable uh, because you cannot accept votes cast after the, uh, uh, on the day of election or any, any uh, ballots received after the election date. So that can be presented to Supreme Court, and Supreme Court may give, make a decision on that. And but even they say, even the, the, the Supreme Court, let's say, said, okay, you cannot accept or the 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 the, the, the ballots received after the uh, election day is not acceptable. They say that even that number of votes are not enough to turn the election to Trump and uh, turn it around and make the Trump win. So there are a lot of speculations. There are a lot of numbers going back and forth. And I really don't know, I, or let's put it this way. I believe Trump knows more than what you and I know. Sure. So because he sounds very confident that he's going to win. That's at the same time, that's his character. I mean, don't get me wrong. So sure. uh, time will tell. But uh, from a, from a time-wise, from a scheduling, from a calendar perspective, what I heard, what I have read is that uh, December 14th is a critical date. December 14th is the date where the states, each state, tallies their, their votes. Okay. and then certify certify the results and then send it to send it to Washington DC for certification if, uh, by Mike Pence who is the vice president and which has to happen sometime will in January by constitution by US constitution the new president whether it's Trump or Biden doesn't matter has to take over the Oval Office in White House on January 20th. That's a set yeah. date. Yeah. That's actually the date that they do the inauguration ceremonies and all that in uh, D.C. So worst case scenario, we will know by January 20th who is the president once he sets foot in White House. This is very interesting because, you know, uh, when you look at the situation, Clearly, there is uh, divided, uh, you know, feelings, and it's not easy for anyone uh, to accept this. As I mentioned, as you mentioned nicely, Mehmet, 
uh, this is uh, President Trump's character to be very uh, definite. But at the same time, some say, some uh, analytics uh, that I am talking to are saying, Yavuz, President Trump is actually preparing for the 2024 election. And this is a strategy to let Biden start weak, because if Biden starts weak to begin with, with a questionable uh, victory, he will be from day one starting uh, the election preparation. And for 2024, he will have a higher chance of getting back a Republican uh, nominee and with Republican victory. What do you think? I, I think that's true. And I am 99% sure that he will run for 2024. And that's, again, what you just said is a great strategy, if you think about it, for Trump, saying that, hey, uh, even if I lost to you, Biden, uh, I lost only because there were some fraud, there were some uh, irregularities, there were some uh, oversight, and you didn't win because I, uh, you didn't win because I lost. You only won by technicality or something like that. And he will, that way, he will remain strong, like a strong man, like he sure. always uh, poses when he is uh, in front of a TV or anything like that. I, uh, by the way, I'm not going to go into the details, but I have a friends who know him personally, mm -hmm. and they say the same thing that uh, I've heard many stories about Trump, so I'm not going to repeat it here sure. because uh, I really don't know if I need to, if I can uh, share that with you. But he he is a person like that. His character is strong, and he he doesn't want to lose. And sure. even if he if he is losing, he wants still wants to look strong. So uh, I'm not surprised that uh, he has a strategy like that. So we'll see, we'll see. Time time will tell. Thank you, Mehmet. So with President Biden and Vice President Harris on board, uh, what will be the impact on the foreign policy of United States? Because most of our viewers are international and trying to understand and read how will this impact China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Europe, NATO, you name it. And from your view, you know, this has always have been an analysis. Would you agree Russia is the largest national threat for Biden and China is the largest national threat for Trump administration? I cannot tell you that. I don't know yet. Uh, time will tell as Biden gets, uh, uh, gets on board and he, when he's in the White House. But one thing is very clear. Uh, he said that he will be more friendly to his allies and he will be tougher on the non-allies. Mm -hmm. In this case, and the other, thing that, uh, the other thing that he said repeatedly is that he will reverse or update the positions that Trump took in the past four years. So what does that tell you? Trump was very good with Russia. So what do you think? Uh, with all these statements, I would, I would assume that he will be tough on Russia, right? Yes. Uh, Ch China, Trump was very tough on China. And so what's going to happen? I would, would you be surprised if Biden is soft uh, on yeah. China and against China? And they already are saying that she, uh, he is planning to appoint this uh, this lady. I forgot her name, but she is an expert in Chinese in Chinese relations and commerce relations. So, so if she's bringing her on board to the cabinet, that means that she he wants Biden wants uh, amicable terms and a friendlier relationship with China. So, same thing with Iran. Uh, Trump was very tough on Iran, you know what he did, and uh, all these uh, reversing these things that Obama did and all that. Now, uh, more than likely, Biden is going to reverse that, or at least he's going to try that, try to reverse it, or at least update it to the favor of the United States. Uh, with Turkey, uh, if you're asking me about Turkey, yes. uh, you know, Biden had several comments against uh, the current government and Erdogan specifically, President Erdogan. So, uh, so when he is in White House, will he change his outlook? Uh, 
I really don't know. It has happened in the past. But uh, so we will see again, we'll, time will tell. Because at the end of the day, as I said earlier in, my, uh, in, in our conversation, uh, Biden will be the president of the establishment, if anything. And therefore, whatever the establishment, uh, establishment's um, uh, way of thinking is, he will, he will repeat that, he will incorporate that. So if, if the establishment or if the common sense if says that, hey, you have to be, we have to be friendly with Turkey, he will be friendly with Turkey. Uh, at the end of the day, what needs to happen is that uh, Turkey, has, uh, Turkey needs to talk with, with Biden. Erdogan and uh, other members of the cabinet, uh, and, uh, will, I'm sure, will get in the conversation with Biden and his, his cabinet. And I'm sure there things, uh, good things will come out of it. I, I'm, I'm sure of that. Turkey and the United States have been allies for what for a hundred years or more, uh, and uh, the, this ally, the alliance, will not falter. It will not uh, uh, be affected adversely. At least that's what I think. Yeah. Thank you, Mehmet. And in terms of. The $100 billion goal between Turkey and the United States, that has always a goal of the administration. Do you think that goal will continue? The goal will continue. Will we be able to achieve that? I don't know. Sure. Because, yeah, we are trying. I mean, uh, I know, uh, I, 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 as I spoke earlier, uh, Musiat, I also represent Musiat and Ascon in sure. Florida. Beautiful. I mean, we are all trying to uh, improve the uh, the commercial. The, uh, the, the we are trying to achieve that hundred billion goal collectively. Uh, we are not there yet. We are not where we really want to be. But I believe with uh, with the new administration, and uh, we can be there. We can uh, we can be there. We can get closer to that goal. But nothing comes easy. You have, we have to work on it. Sure. We have to all work on it uh, collectively. Going through the global issues, let's get to Syria, Mehmet. In terms of Syria, as you know, for the Trump administration, we throw increasing the soldiers further was a red line. What do you think the Biden administration will do? Uh, and you may say it establishment, some say globalist, you know, for his approach. So do you see any change in the position of United States of America and Syria. Uh, what was it? It's, it was, uh, I believe, in 2011 or 2012, somewhere around that. Uh, it was uh, uh, Obama's time. I had a conversation with uh, congressman from Florida, mm -hmm. and I that was the time there, the the civil war uh, uh, in Syria was escalating and. Uh, Assad, Assad regime was killing uh, the innocent people, mm -hmm. and I believe it was right after that uh, chemical attack, chemical bomb attack. I, 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 I don't recall the exact year, so uh, forgive, please, uh, the, forgive me for that. Sure. But when I was talking with the uh, the congressman, I asked him. I said, "What, what are you guys planning on doing?" At that time, uh, United States was considering setting boots in Syria uh, to uh, basically control the situation and stop the killings, stop the massacre. And he said, he told me, he says, Mehmet, uh, we were 99% we were sure that we were going to do it. And we were invited to White House for a briefing. And there, they were. They briefed us that hey, that's that's the plan. This is how we are going to do it, and all that. And then, as soon as that surfaced in the media, we started receiving numerous calls from our constituents, basically negating with that idea and saying that hey, we don't want any more U.S. soldiers in anywhere outside the U.S. We don't want to be part of their somebody else's war. We don't want our uh, men and women killed for uh, in the foreign soils. And it says, we received so many calls 
we had to reverse our take on that. And then I believe, uh, and I believe at that time, some the U.S. still did something, but st did not set boots. In other words, they didn't send any soldiers to Syria. Later on, it changed a little bit during Trump's time. I don't know how many soldier, U.S. soldiers are in the uh, in in Syria, but I think they're not too many. Yes. Uh, maybe a thousand, uh, fifteen hundred. I I really don't don't know the number. So, them uh, now. Uh, I was reading the other day that Trump wants them back before his he turns out. Uh, so, uh, in the U.S., I mean, if you ask me the question about what the U.S. American people feel about it, I would say they don't care much. I mean, they, at the end of the day, they want to they want to know that their uh, soldiers are safe and sound. So, I don't think they, they are they would be happy if if their if the U.S. soldiers are there, continue to be there, and in the in the harm's way. So, um, thank you. So uh, let's get to Africa because that's also a very important question. You know, what will be the position of the United States of America with uh, the President-elect Biden for Africa? You mentioned, you know, the Muslim ban will be taking off from day one, and there are some countries in Africa, but there are also other countries in the Middle East. So, but overall, in terms of trade, you know, in terms of political, influence, media, funds, uh, you know, uh, uh, and investment and technology and other areas. What will be the U.S. position in Africa in the coming in the days? Uh, before the program, I was going through the, uh, the, the campaign notes and promises of Biden on, the, on, on Africa. And they're all positive, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. They want to support democratic institutions on the continent advance peace and security, uh, promote ec economic growth, trade and investment, and support sustainable development. That's, that's Biden's goals. How is he going to do it? He says that he's going to share prosperity, peace and security, uh, democracy and governance. Uh, he's also planning to restore and reinvigorate diplomatic relations with African governments and uh, regional institutions such as African Union, and one another promise that he has for the African diaspora. I'm talking about the Africans who live in the United States, and he promises that they will be more employed in the uh, U.S. government and U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, and the last one is there's an initiative called Young African Leaders Initiative. And they want to continue that and also engage with Africans, Af Africa's uh, dynamic young leaders. So there is an interest from the United States to engage more with Africa, uh, at least in the, in the next four years when Biden gets uh, in the White House. Thank you, Mehmet. Uh, that's very important for our African viewers because 2020 was an election year and 2021 as well. So peaceful transition in the United States will set a model for our uh, you know, African brothers and sisters. And when I look at it, there were more than 20 elections in 2020 in Africa, and there will be many more in 2021. So we hope the best for you know, always a democratic and peaceful transition across Africa. My next question is about a very important historical victory of Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh, as you know, uh, you know, Turkey is ready to send uh, a new military uh, group, uh, army, to Azerbaijan in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. And with the mediation of uh, Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan agreed for a, uh, actually a strong peace, not just a ceasefire, for the next five years. And, you know, there are some claims that Pashinyan regime was supported with some, uh, you know, sponsored groups like Soros and other uh, diaspora within United States and other groups in France. But I want to get your take on what will President Biden, uh, the President-elect Biden, will do for the Nagorno-Karabakh region? Uh, yeah, was, I read his views. This, this was before the ceasefire. 
Okay. And he he's basically he was first of all he 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 criticized Trump by, uh, for not be for being passive and not getting involved. Gotcha. And uh, and then he was of course he wants peace. He wants cease, he wanted ceasefire, which happened now. And uh, he wanted the U.S. And I'm sure when he is in White House, he will do that. He will be. He wants to be more involved with the peace negotiations. The United States wants to be more involved in the peace negotiations between Armenia and uh, and uh, and Azerbaijan, our brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. And uh, the ish. <laughs> And he also made a comment that Iran and Turkey should stay out of it, uh, uh, so that, uh, at least in his view, he wants uh, Turkey and uh, Iran out of the picture, at least during the negotiations. There Uh, are some claims that Russia is now in that region not just to protect peace, but in case a clash happens between United States and Iran, Russia by keeping his, its presence there, it has also an advantage over interfering Iran, which is an Armageddon scenario, I know. But we're just talking hypothetically here, uh, which caught me off guard. But what do you think of that? Um, I, it's the first time I hear about it. Uh, I really don't know. I, I, I don't think I should comment on it. Sure. There's one more thing. Uh, Biden also said that he also criticized Armenia by, by saying that, hey, uh, you, uh, he wants to make it clear to Armenia that regions surrounding Nagomo Karabakh cannot be occupied indefinitely. I see. And that credible negotiations uh, must commence immediately for peace, um, which is a good thing, which is what needs to happen, which That's is what we all want, right? Of course. Uh, I mean, it's a region of energy and an energy corridor. It's a crucial area for the United States, for China, for Russia for Turkey, for Armenia and Azerbaijan. So uh, I agree correct. with you. I agree with you. Uh, so uh, I think the most important question for me, because you are a really role model, Mehmet, in Florida, and what Thank you're doing you. is commendable, you know, representing communities actively with Engage. And I know, you know, there will be examples like Omar Ilhan and many more who will influence the politics in the United States, and especially that one million vote campaign. I want you to tell me how did the Turkish Americans, African Americans, as well as the you know minorities and the Muslims impacted the elections in the United States? Well, uh, the, the mis- one million Muslim water, the, we call it uh, one, uh, one MMV, uh, is an initiative taken by MGH, which is, you know, as I we talked earlier, I'm the uh, South Florida uh, chair for it. it. It was successful. Well, we didn't reach a million, but we were close, close enough. And uh, in terms of Tur- Turkish Americans, we are about 3, 300,000 uh, Turkish Americans live in the United States. That is less than, that's about 0.1% of the total population. So population-wise, we are not there. Uh, But we are effective, like through task that uh, uh, we didn't have a chance to talk about earlier. But, uh, you know, I also represent task, which is Turkish American Steering Committee uh, in South Florida. Uh, I want to talk briefly about task, which is... uh, yeah, uh, I'm the pro- as I said, I'm the Florida representative. Task focuses on uh, public education and advocacy programs that support Turkish American civic empowerment and strong United States Turkey relationship. Uh, task board is comprised of uh, Turkish American leaders, community leaders, and and not only Turkish American but also from the Muslim American uh, communities as well. Uh, what we are, what task is looking out is basically the for the fair share that's what we call it fair share that the turkish americans deserve we just want our fair share that's it you don't know no no more no less Mehmet, Uh, with 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 the number uh, so close between democrats and republicans i believe three hundred thousand is not a small count and also that one million vote is not a small count frankly speaking if one, it can sway who will become the president. 
That's why I, I think what you're doing at task and engage is very important. So over the next three minutes, can you tell more about what engage does and what task does and do you guys achieve what you want during this 2020? Uh, to, to be, uh, we did, we did achieve what we wanted. Well, we were not so, uh, <laughs> uh, for, let me talk about engage. Engage did endorse Biden Harris. Sure. Engage endorsed Biden Harris and and Biden Harris won. So that that's a success. In Florida, Biden Harris lost. So that was not so success for Engage. But mm -hmm. the million Muslim vote was it turned out very strongly. And I'll tell you one more thing that the, the, about 70% of the Muslim Americans living in the United States voted for Biden Harris. Sure. Uh, because of the ob some obvious reasons, uh, first of all, uh, uh, historically, uh, Muslim Americans have always been more welcomed by the Dem Democratic Party rather than re the Republican Party. And then hence, we have Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Those yes. are two congresswomen uh, in the United States, and they will continue to serve in the Congress. Uh, I know Ilhan Omar. I, I've met her several times, and uh, we have. A, uh, she's a great uh, woman and a great activist. So uh, we, we are. Very so she has Somalian television here as well. So we that's will correct. Host her in the uh, future, so. Actually, <laughs> I, I keep joking about it. I say, you know, she's my uh, my wife's friend because they sat next to each other in a program where she was in South Florida. Uh, she is. She's a petite woman. She's a uh, little sure. lady, but she is full of energy. Yes. She's like uh, one of those, uh, you know, the, the bunnies that run on uh, batteries. She's just like that. And, and, and she, she's very much liked in the community, in the Muslim American community. And we keep supporting her and we will continue to support her. Thank you. Uh, you're right about, yes, we are not, so, I mean, I believe we have, we are like six, seven million uh, Muslim Americans living in the states, but we do affect, we do affect the uh, uh, elections, especially in swing states like in Florida. This time we did, we couldn't. Yes, I mean the Trump won uh, decisively, but that doesn't mean that the next elections we it will, that we will not. So uh, the Democratic Party uh, or Republican Party, because as Engage we are bipartisan. We don't. We don't pick sides. Sure. We pick uh, candidates. Uh, we we thought that at least uh, the national board of Engage thought that Biden Harris is a better choice. That's why uh, went with Biden Harris. Uh, and in other cases also, we look at the candidate and we have conversation with them. We visit them. They visit us. We hear from them. Uh, and then we make a uh, decision on endorsement. Uh, thank you, Mehmet. We have to close, uh, and I would love to thank you on behalf of NTR TV for really providing your amazing view on behalf of Turkish American Steering Committee in Florida, as well as Engage, and also Musiad and Ascon. Thank you for your hard work in the United States, and we look forward to hosting you again. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the end of our show. I want to thank you on behalf of News Plus, which is one of the most viewed shows in Africa because the truth matters. This is your anchorman, Yo Selim Sulay. Take care and all the best. Uh, stay tuned to NTR every Tuesday, 1 p.m. African time, live. Take care. Bye. <laughs>